Thank you very much for this warm introduction. And thank you for staying here for this last lecture. I know it's tempting, tempting to go outside, but I'll, I'll be as short as possible. Uh, okay. Uh, I know that the title of my uh, lecture is a little bit obscure, so you have to excuse me for that, but I'm going to start with a story then. And I will tell you the story of this island. And this island is called North Sentinel. Uh, did any one of you hear about this land, North Sentinel Island? Anyone, raise your hand. One person, okay, so you probably already know what I have to say, All right? so we can do something else. Um, but this will just take a couple of minutes and then I will stay on track. So this uh, North Sentinel Island, as you see, is not a big, well, you cannot really see that, but it's not a big island. It's slightly bigger, I think, than Krakow. Uh, it's mostly covered with trees. Uh, around it, you have this coral reef, and then it's surrounded by the waters. It's part of Adaman's Island uh, under the governing rule of the government of India. And what is interesting about this island, uh, well, not just the conditions, because you could see many islands like that around the world, but one specific very interesting feature of that is that it's inhabited. And the natives that live there have a very, very interesting feature. Right? You could see them here. And what is interesting about them is that probably the, the way they are living right now, they have been living for, well, not them, but their ancestors, living for 55 years thousand years, right? So not much has changed in that society for around 55,000 years. Of course, it's a guess because we don't really know. Uh, we don't really have studies. We can just sort of speculate and guess what is going on there and how different the societies from other uh, native tribes that you can find around the world because definitely we see tribes around the world, but the main difference be be between this one and the other ones around the world is that, that this one probably has no contact with the outside world. The other tribes you will find, like Hadza and, and people in, in, in Americas, the other tribes got in contact with, uh, with uh, the surroundings, right? So they got in contact with other civilizations, they got, they got in contact with the modern man. Uh, this tribe, on the other hand, well, you might try going there and visiting them. You can even go to Google reviews and read some honey reviews. Uh, of course, they are not true because when you show up there, these people will, will greet you with bows and arrows. All right. So once you see them, I mean, you're probably dead unless you have a machine gun so you can protect yourself. Right. So immediately when they see anyone outside from the external world, they want to exterminate that person. Right. So that's an example of perfectly, well, not perfectly, but close to perfection, closed society which tries to stay away from external surroundings, from external forces, right? So if someone sends you to Somalia, and if it's a conservative, you can tell that conservative to go to North Sentinel, because this is true conservatism, like in, in an absolutely extreme form, right? I mean, just it doesn't get more radical than that, right? If you want to have completely coast society, which is totally faithful to what has been going on for thousands of years, well, you have to just go there. Anything from that is progress, right? I mean, it's something changed and the society is different. Uh, the way those people live, uh, it's probably hunter-gatherers. They have no fire, probably. Definitely no developed industry, no developed uh, agriculture. Uh, and probably they live in the form of Malthusian trap. Uh, we speculate that maybe there are 50 of them or 400. We, we, we're really not sure. And we know the, from the various encounters that they are very hostile. Like in uh, 1974, uh, when National Geographic tried to do the, the documentary about them, well, the director ended up with an arrow in the leg, right? So that was in 1974. Uh, then there was another encounter which was accidental in, uh, it was 1981, when cargo ship, because of some typhoon, accidentally ended up on the island. The captain and the crew saw that this, you know, this island looks pretty nice, so we can stay here and wait for a rescue. Oh, look, there are people there uh, on the island. Oh, they are constructing boats. What do they have in their hands? Oh, that's pretty sharp tools, right? So they immediately called for help, and fortunately they were rescued, but, but the natives were already constructing their weapons to just attack the crew and, and kill all of them. Uh, then there was the case 
uh, 12 years ago, in 2006, of drunken fishermen uh, who were fishing nearby, and they accidentally ended up on the island, immediately killed by, uh, by the population there. Uh, even though it's forbidden to uh, fish there, right? The government says you're supposed to leave these people in peace. Uh, you know, sometimes you get drunk, you fish, and it ends up with a tragedy. Um, uh, the, and, and as you see, some of you here are probably libertarians, so you like to discuss lifeboat situations, right? So you imagine you have people on a lifeboat ending up on someone else's island, right? There you go. Sometimes libertarians actually do some practical considerations, right? I mean, where you have real-world cases of, of conflicts that happen, like was it trespassing or not, right? It's not, it's not a discussion in vain sometimes, right? Um, uh, and, uh, and there was another encounter <coughs> in 2004 when tsunami hit uh, Asia. As you remember, it was a big tragedy. Thousands of people died. And for sure, tsunami hit the, that island too. So the Indian government sent the helicopter to help. And you can imagine where it goes from here. It was greeted in the usual manner, right? right? This, is, this is how you reject government aid, like completely, <laughs> completely fully principled, right? You just stay away, right? Stay away out of my beach community, right? I mean, so, uh, yeah, and the, the reason why I'm bringing this up, uh, the case of North Sentinel, is that I want to start with this extremely closed case of the society, which is perfectly closed. And as I will tell you in a second, there might be some rationality behind this, behind this extreme form of xenophobia, right? Because xenophobia in itself is just some form of evolutionary characteristic which has its own justification in the particular circumstances. Unfortunately, a lot of it stays with us even in modern economies and, and, and it wrecks uh, our economy. But in some circumstances, actually, as uh, Steven Neuberg, the neuropsychologist says, there could be some rationalization for being xenophobic. Okay, so uh, to come back to the um, main title, I mean, this uh, open system, closed system, and uh, uh, social economic contestability, we have this fancy word called the system, what it is, well, it's something that is separated from the surroundings, right? So you have three terms which immediately define themselves because you have a system, you have the surroundings, and you have the boundary. And if there is no boundary, if there is mixing of the surroundings and the system, could it be um, computer system, political system, social system, economic system, doesn't really matter. If there is no boundary, then of course, then just mixing, there is no system, right? You need to have a certain boundary. But how strong this boundary is, how filtering it is by letting things in or letting things out, it tells you how open it is. And the case of North Sentinel is the case of extremely close society to any form of change, or like most form of change, because some things probably change on that island. And I will try to speculate what uh, uh, especially that led them to be xenophobic. So, um, how do we decide whether the system should be more closed or more open, right? How do you make a decision? And I mean here any type of system. It can be economic system, when we, for example, consider firms evolving, like starting a new, uh, starting a new startup, starting a new company, or uh, delivering new product, uh, trying to contest the market. It can also be, doesn't have to be economic. Uh, challenge, right? Because as we know from history, there are lots of challenges, and lots of ideas of how to change existing order. Like take the case of Marxists and Bolsheviks, right? That was also some idea to change things, right? To experiment, to introduce something new into society, right? So any, uh, any this form, this uh, plan of changing existing things is a challenge, right? And the question is, should we try to experiment? Should we allow new things in? Or how do we allow them is the question of making a proper choice and assessing it. So what do we do? We do SWOT analysis. I know you hate SWOT analysis because you know about it from your classes, but I don't like it too. But there is some truth in it, like strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And you try to analyze, right? You try to assess. You try to decide what are the downsides and what are the benefits. Now, the strategy to conserve, right, when you have uh, uh, conserving, it has two features. On the one hand, it conserves advantages. So what we did yesterday had, has some advantages, definitely. But at the same time, we might be, and probably we are, repeating some mistakes about which we might not know. And so conserving this is a double-edged sword. And similarly, uh, uh, contesting creates opportunities, opportunities, but at the same time, it also creates threats, right? So, Obviously, you have this, this swap analysis in your mind. So should we change the policy? 
right? You have this puzzle of, of trying to balance one thing and the other. Uh, actually, it also applies to the individual. When you consider Crusoe case, uh, like think about uh, Robinson Crusoe on the, on the island, making a decision, right? I live at this part of land, I have coconuts, but I have to climb up there, and it's really, it's wasting a lot of time, but this is the only resource I have. Should I go next, like behind the mountain, and see what's there? Okay, there are some opportunities, maybe there are pineapples, I don't have to climb, I'm just gonna grab them being on the ground. Uh, but at the same time, there may be some animals, there may be some threats, right? So for Crusoe, it's even complicated because of the first problem, the problem of information, right? So you don't have full, full information. But things get even more complicated when you create society or when you think about that in terms of society because second of all, people are different and have diff they have different value scales and they, ha they have different normative systems which cannot really be brought down to common denominator or it's really hard to bring down all the values to common denominator, like to get all the people to agree on certain issues. And those things uh, are subjective. Uh, they are subjective not in a sense that um, um, they are subjective in a sense that they are chosen by the individual, right? So I'm not saying there is no objective value. I'm just saying this from the perspective of social science and from the perspective of methodological individualism, everyone has his, her own values, right? So this means that there is some, um, you can find some common ground for those values, but you cannot really completely reduce it to the common denominator usually, right? So everyone has their own value structure. <laughs> so that's the second problem. And then, sorry, I have a little sore throat. And then there's a third problem, which is the problem of valuation in time when you do SWOT analysis. Right? You especially see it in the discussion about global warming. Now, when you talk about global warming, there are costs and there are benefits. Assuming you have information, because that's another problem, the problem of information, whether the models that we use are correct, you can easily challenge that. But assuming, even assuming this problem away, you have the problem of discounting Right? The problem of time preference, as Austrian economists like to say. So how do you value things in time? When you have present benefits or benefits tomorrow compared to benefits 100 years from now, the same thing with costs, they are not of the same value. Right? So you have to choose some discount on future values, both costs and benefits, and then you can make a decision. Right? So you have these three problems. Right? Uh, one is that you do not really have full information. The second one is that uh, you have social tensions between various groups and differences in, in values. And then the third problem, which is simply discounting of values in time, which complicates the case so much, right? So SWOT analysis is really hard, right? You cannot really decide. But many people would say, how do we choose? Well, that's easy. We just calculate right, where to go. How do we make a decision? We just calculate. There is a problem with this, right? And this gentleman has a problem with that. Who is that? Yeah, that's good. That's Frank Knight, yes, slowly committing suicide in his office, right, by inhaling a deadly substance, as you see. So Frank Knight is famous for his work on risk and uncertainty. He's also famous for other stuff, or should be infamous, uh, but this is actually one of his most important contributions, is this distinction between risk and uncertainty, right? And in case of risk, as many of you probably here know, in case of risk, we have probability which is calculable, right? You can just manage risk. Right? You get more information about classes of events, you group them together, and then you can do some form of calculation of what the future outcomes are. And uh, most of, actually, scientific discoveries from natural sciences and, and uh, general progress that we see in sciences is based, based on this either deterministic view or some form of class probability, is that we group things, we, we gather statistics, and we see some connections between them. And then this all is, of course, implemented in a mercantile market environment by, by the entrepreneurs of how these things should be embodied right, uh, within the monetary calculation, but that's a different story. So anyway, risk in itself, as you know, is measurable, and you can easily make a calculative decision if there are class probabilities. It easily applies to casinos, right? So human beings who actually understand how casinos work, they don't go to the casinos, right? Because it's so simple. If, if I tell you uh, that every time I throw a coin, you have to pay me $1.10, and if you guess correctly, I'm gonna give you $2, right? No one will play this game because you just realize, okay, so every two games I pay two twenty, but then I win just two. Obviously, I will lose in the long run, right? But many people don't see that if you complicate it and do the roulette, right? And you have 37 numbers, it, it, it get confused, right? You cannot really do calculation that quickly. 
but this is risk. And in opposition to that, we have pure uncertainty, meaning that uh, uh, events which are unique and which are not, uh, which we did not experience, we, we discovered the things we don't know about, so we cannot really apply class probability directly to those events. And so we have a problem. We cannot really calculate that easily, assuming a couple of problems away that I told you about. <coughs> so, uh, in general, our progress, collective learning through generations happens through uh, the taming of ignorance, right? So we uh, resolve ignorance first, as I said, by, by doing the class probability. Uh, but with case probability, we just have attempts to tame it, right? So we have attempts about what we, don't, we just don't know, and we cannot really group them in classes. Moreover, these two things, doing the risk analysis and case and, and uncertainty analysis, well, the risk analysis is with us for a short amount of us, meaning human beings, is for a short amount of time. For the most time we've been walking around the Earth is, is uh, the um, other attempt, that is to deal with case probability. And this brings me back to North Sentinel case. As we know from various notes and studies, uh, North Sentinel, uh, people of North Sentinel, got in contact with civilization in the 19th century with the Brits. And, you know, the British people had this interesting way of showing the natives, uh, the, the, the native tribes, uh, that they are not that bad by kidnapping them, right? Uh, I know, crazy, but they still they did. So they kidnapped people from, from the tribe, and then they returned them after a couple of days to just show that they are not that bad, right? I mean, you just kidnap people, right? They, they still survive, so they might not be that bad, right? Unfortunately, so they kidnapped six people from North Sentinel, and two of them, adults, immediately died. And then the remaining four uh, was returned, it was children. Uh, we don't know what happened to them. Uh, who knows, maybe they, they, they were killed immediately and treated as a form of uh, um, invasion also. But there is also possibility that uh, those children were uh, infected uh, because the two people I told you about, they died because of the contact with the bacteria with the Europeans. Uh, which, by the way, also had an important um, influence of dying of Indians in United in uh, Americas, right? The same thing. They're being exposed to bacteria, there is no immunity, so um, it end, ends up in, in the form of like genocide, indirect genocide, as you would say. So similarly, in this case, perhaps the children that were returned in the 19th century to North Sentinel, they might have been infected, and who knows, maybe the population of North Sentinel, which was 500, then suddenly started to be like 200, right? Because like uh, over half a population died because of the disease from Europe. Now, with the lack of knowledge that you have, like uh, medical knowledge, with the lack of the drugs and developed pharmaceutical industries, that has its own benefits, by the way, <coughs> uh, with, without all that, how do you tame that ignorance, right? So how, what do you do? Well, you approximate, you categorize, you estimate, you classify, you guess. This is what you do, this is all you, all you have. Like if you cannot really, you don't have full information, you are acting on patterns, right? So we have this closed tribe, and this might be, it's a hypothesis, but it might justify there is xenophobia, right? So when we got in contact with the external population, well, they kidnapped our people, then two of them didn't return, and then they returned four children, and then they brought in the disease, right? and that basically ended up in genocide of our population because it killed most of us. So what do we about that? Well, if they show up again, if those monsters, like you remember Village, the movie, right? Monsters from the Village, right? Or the others from Lost TV series, right? Showing up, kidnapping people, doing some strange stuff. So if they show up, we have to immediately kill them and wipe them out because if not, our, life sits, our whole uh, uh, existence is at stake, right? Uh, and that would make a lot of sense uh, because the way you see those people acting, they are so determined, absolutely determined. Right? There is no question, absolutely determined in killing off the people that show up from the outside, that it has to be embodied. The idea of doing that has to be deeply embodied in their minds. No hesitation, just fight them off immediately because the threat is so serious. So the approximation, categorization, estimation, classification, and guessing is just inherent in human nature, right? The same thing even if, uh, with animals, like Pavlov dogs, they just approximate that the bell is doing something, so they react to it. 
Uh, and we do the approximation and categorization estimation all the time, right? Especially when we encounter people, like if I show you this picture. Or uh, if you go into dark alley somewhere in New York and, you, and it's after midnight and you see the children joining like this, jumping and smiling, dressed like that, I mean, you, you don't really feel uh, uncomfortable, right? Well, you might a little bit, but uh, because it's late, it's strange what they're doing there, but you, know, you don't feel really threatened. But, but if you go into the dark alley and you, uh, try to, you encounter another individual, right, without the shirt, with the tattoos and, and all the rings like that, and an angry face, you feel uncomfortable, right? Why? Because you approximate, you categorize, right? You try to, uh, <coughs> you try to extrapolate your past experience, right? At the same time, this is, I mean, this is not something inherently threatening, right? If you go to some other society in which everyone looks like this, right, and it's just, it's just a cultural code to dress like that, you will feel comfortable, right? But this is, this is, this, uh, the, the way you assess the situation is based on your form of experience and understanding of, of the surroundings of the reality. So you're not really doing that any form of like extreme form of class probability analysis. So back to SWOT analysis, right? So back to making the decision. So, when there is something new comes up, right? The idea to do Bolshevik revolution, right? Or the idea to introduce a new product. They are not the same things, by the way. I'm not equating them, right? But anything, any idea of doing something differently than it was before, right? Uh, this is the way of actually correcting our mistakes. So, experimenting is necessary. Uh, but at the same time, risk awareness is crucial. Right, so on the one hand, you're thinking about the potentials, and on the other thing, you, uh, on the other side, on the other hand, you're thinking about the threats uh, that are inherent in any possible choice that you make. Usually, when you have um, that, that's another interesting observation, um, it, is that when you have social conflicts about many issues, or when you consider political parties, well, most of you are from. I think from, Pol from Poland, but uh, you might have seen or you might have been interested in other political uh, uh, markets, so to speak, or in other countries, or many of you are from other countries. When you, he when you hear about these distinctions between conservatives, liberal liberals, or Republicans, Democrats, or left, right, it's usually, uh, it's usually the distinction between them is how we approach the new things, right? And this is more crucial, actually. Are they more risk aware to changing things or remaining the status quo, or are they actually interesting in experimenting and trying something new, right? This division is actually more universal when you think about it. It applies even better to understand the political system. Well, that's my opinion. So anyway, <laughs> when you are personally making your choice, right? So you are thinking, uh, should I, what, what do I do with my life, right? Um, should I go and study this or that? Should I meet this person? Should I be friends with the other person? What do you do? Well, you balance out by asking opinions, right? Well, not of all of you, but usually think, well, you know, I have to get to know the opinions of others. I mean, what's my parents' opinion? What's my friend's opinion? Uh, uh, what, what are the opinion when you, when you choose your school? You ask for opinions of, of other students and so forth, right? Or if you want to start a business, you are to ask some other people about starting other business and so forth. Right, so the one thing you do, you balance out the opinions. <clears throat> and, and the other thing is that, well, you have to keep it at bay. I mean, you keep the risk at bay. So you know you gotta move out when, uh, when there is an imminent, imminent threat. Uh, and these two things are actually the cornerstone of making the choice, which might be good or not. And it opens to us the, uh, the idea of how to uh, think about the social system which would benefit experimenting on one hand, but at the same time, it would allow us to conserve as much as possible, not to make uh, um, bad choices. So, to summarize, or to uh, get on with my final thoughts, uh, if only could we have a social system that has two features, right? So one feature would be uh, that it relies on persuasion of others to experiment, right? So you, you're free to to try something new. I mean, it's your choice, why not? Uh, but you have to persuade some people to do this, right? So both on the personal and on the material level. So on the personal level, you're thinking about starting some social project. You need to recruit human capital, right? So take volunteers, people interested, invite them in and tell them, yeah, let's try doing this. This is something good, right? I mean, we should change the world. Let's do it together, right? So invite human capital. 
Then at the same time, you have to secure some of the resources, so you have to convince some of the investors to put the assets in, some of the savings, your grandmother's savings, or some, uh, uh, some funds uh, from, from the financial market, uh, or some funds from a private company, it all depends, right? But you rely on persuasion, meaning that you are bounded by the opinions of others, right? The opinions of others matter to you, and you are bound by, the, by those opinions. So that would be one feature. Uh, and another feature would be that uh, uh, the system would internalize potential risks as much as possible, meaning that if there are inherent risks with any project, then those risks uh, would not w make sure that those risks are limited to the particular group, right? So there is no threat on, of contamination, that if you make a bad choice, that many people outside of that will suffer, why? Right? Because of you. So for example, when you have an idea of creating a sort of communist society, small communist society, you, you, you can actually do that doing those two things, right? So first of all, you persuade some people, but once you persuade them, you make sure that it, it, it stays with that group, so you are not really uh, spreading the risks outside, right? So you are not making uh, people involuntarily part of your project. Uh, then, like, if only we could have such a system that would do those two things, right? So we rely on persuasion of others uh, to experiment and internalize potential risk, then, you know, that system would be interesting because then it would balance out the, the optimal, it would create an optimal balance between experimenting with new things and with conserving the things by making sure that, that serious risks are avoided. Because in general, human beings survived on this planet because human beings are fearful, right? In general, we are, we are fearful, right? Human beings are fearful, right? We are afraid. Um, so we, we don't like to risk. Some of us do. We have those people climbing the mountains, going to Mount Everest, K2, and so on, right? A couple of people or some business people doing crazy stuff, spending money or God knows what, right? So uh, we have, but most of the population is actually risk averse, right? Uh, another interesting thing would be the, uh, that there is some possibly biological mechanism by in human species also, right? Uh, those of you who have children, uh, or those of you who know children that have at least two or more, you know that they are totally different, right? I mean, and you know that even in the similar circumstances when you raise them, uh, when they are, for example, whatever, 15 months, Right? One child decides to jump from the, st from the chair and the other child is totally afraid. And you know that the, the, really the conditions were the same, right? but you see that their risk awareness is totally different. Right? The way they, they want to explore the world is different, the approach is different. So we have this form of diversity in human society and, and, and in human genes perhaps, but in general in human personality we have this huge diversity. And in order to best economize on that diversity, on those skills and on those potentials, well, it would be to have those two things, the system that would you know, rely on persuasion of others, so you make sure that other opinions are balancing out, and on the other hand, the system that would inter internalize those risks. Right? I'm still thinking about the type of system that is possible like that, that actually has those two features. I still didn't come up with the idea, but you know, if, well, if, if you have an idea what type of system that could be, then just let me know. Okay, thank you.